Today, we want to find out who is in ministry. Who is a man who is called? There are five protocols. There are five requirements that makes for a minister of God. And you will have to bury yourself in God's presence until experientially you have those five in your quiver. Else, if you go out, you will mislead a generation. Number one, Ministry begins with an encounter. Divine encounter is the starting point of ministry. You can be preaching for 10 years. If you've not had an encounter, you are doing a good spiritual exercise, but ministry has not started. You can be doing a lot of things. You cannot represent a spirit you have not met. Because they are not mortals. It's not a product of creativity. That somebody else is doing it and is working does not mean you are sent to do it. Because God is not looking for what is working. God is trying to bring witnesses to generations. And so when men begin to have encounters, our gathering will become like a spiritual legislative quorum different people will bring different dimensions so when we gather together we'll be like a legislative assembly when we have we don't have encounters we will replicate what other people are doing and we may be gathering people but there will be deficiencies because one man meets god and god wants him to bring his fire another man meets god god wants him to bring his light another man meets god god wants him to bring his love another one meets god God wants him to bring different attributes that reveal God. But when encounters become deficient, all of us will copy what the man of fire is doing. And when we gather together, the whole assembly will become a people of fire. As fireful as the place is, in the spirit realm, they will know that there is a deficiency. Because the full scope of God's essence will not be trapped. This is why, even though it's important to learn one or two things from people, for you to effectively represent a spirit, you must have to encounter that spirit so that it will give you the blueprint of your calling. Without encounters, we can never effectively bring ministry to a generation. It doesn't matter for how long we have been doing it. It will take encounters to redefine the purpose and the essence of our being. I can assure you today that many people who are speaking for God have never met him many people speaking for god have never known him they just copy and paste what they have heard from people who is working for and because one or two things are happening they think they are making progress progress in the spirit is not horizontal progress in the spirit is vertical horizontal expressions are byproduct of vertical transition and when i say vertical i don't mean up I means joining God word. For example, a man, one man can have 2,000 people following him. Another man can have 4,000 people following him. In the realm of God, the person with 2,000 people is making more progress than the person with 4,000 people. If you don't understand how spirit judge things and you are just looking at the horizontal parameters, you will assume that ministry is about crowd and the more people you have, the more godless you will become. Because crowd is actually supposed to be a byproduct of your intimacy with God. You cannot judge your progress based on how many people are surrounding you. Because that is not what defines your progress. When a man begins to journey God's word, he will know God until he will become like God. That's what I call the realms of intimacy. When you meet God, the first thing is that you will know about God. That's the first layer of intimacy. John said that which we have heard. So you will know about God. But after a while, you will go deeper with God. He said, that which we have handled. Those are the principles of the kingdom. You will know what to do to make things work. And then after a while, he said, that which we have looked upon. So this time around, you have gone beyond hearing about God. You have gone beyond handling the principles of God and creating results. You have come to know him that dwells in the secret. So he becomes your shield 
and your exceeding great reward. After a while, God will begin to invite you to his realm. It's the realm of disclosure. After a while, God will bring you to live where his voice dwells. So you will only do what God says to do. You will no longer have the right to be creative. And then after a while, you will become visibly like God. When men see you, they will see God. That's what we call promotion in ministry. If you are joining on these cadres, the natural ones will be additions. But that will never be your focus. If you don't have encounters with God, you will not take serious the journey Godward. You will be more interested in pursuing things. And if you are only pursuing things, a day will come, you will be shocked that those things, you will gain mastery in them and you will start doing them without God. You know, when you start, it will be difficult. To gather 10 people will be difficult. To gather 20 people will be difficult. But a day comes, you become popular. And you don't need to do anything. All you need is a poster. When people see the poster, they will gather. But you will not talk to God, people will still gather. God will not speak to you, people will still gather. You will not have a message, people will still gather. You will now discover that godless men too gather people. So you will understand that ministry is not about how many people are gathered. Ministry is the depth to which you are traveling with God. It is only encounter that will show you what really matters. That's why every time God wants to walk with a man genuinely, he will give that man an encounter. I'm going to be using four men as a case study today. Abraham, Moses, Paul, and Jesus the Lord. And I'm using Jesus because Jesus is the pattern man. Jesus did not just come to save the world. Jesus came to teach man how man should live. So every time we, we study scripture, it's always important to use Jesus as a reference. When Abraham wanted to begin a walk with God, to bet something for God, the first point of reference was encounter. In Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1, it said, God had appeared to Abraham and he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, get thee out of thy kindred, get thee out of my father's house and come to the land that I will show you. God wanted to let Abraham know that what I want to do for you is beyond all that your people are doing. Because amongst your people, they call prosperity the size of land you have. They call prosperity the number of cattle and donkeys you have. So if you are not careful, if I begin to bless you, you may assume that your value in my realm is how many donkeys you have because your people value donkey. So the first thing the encounter did for Abraham was to separate him from his country. So he left what every other person was pursuing and began to pursue after God. It's when you find me that you can begin. And when Abraham found God, at the end of Abraham's life, the Bible said God blessed him with all things. If he was in the hall of the Chaldees, he would have judged his prosperity based on the things he had. But now that God has separated him from everything from the beginning, he now knows that prosperity is not what you have. Prosperity is how much of God you have. And when you have so much of God, the natural things will be byproducts. It will take an encounter to understand it. If you don't have an encounter, you will think ministry is a black jeep. Or ministry is the fact that you have invitation to Canada. You have invitation to Ghana. You have invitation to South Africa. Even gospel, uh, uh, secular musicians have invitations. People will snap at the airport and say, I just landed in Heathrow Airport. The ministry is working. I just landed in, in Kotaku Airport. It is not airport that defines the value of your ministry. It is how much of God you have. Only encounter will make you know that. And when encounters begin to come, a day will come when you will have invitation to preach in the White House. And the spirit you met in the wilderness will tell you not to go. Even though you would have met the U.S. president, the spirit said, don't go. You now understand from another frame of reference. Because encounter will let you know that earth is not an advantage. Your, nativ your nativity is not earth. There is a place where immortals dwell. And where the immortals dwell, they don't judge things by the external value. And because you have known creatures that exist beyond time, no matter what happens in time, it can't get your attention anymore. Men who don't have encounters pursue things. And the more they pursue things, they think they are succeeding. And then they judge themselves. And they have, he said the man's value is not in the multitude of the things he possesses. Only encounters will teach you. Because when you begin to have encounters, a new syllabus is open to you. I know you have learned things that your ancestors did. But your ancestors are not the, the standard. I know you have learned things from your environment. For you to be accurate, that spirit will bring his realm to you. It is the energy and the life of his realm that will teach you the direction that you will go. 
when men don't have encounter a thousand times they will be wrong and so he told Abraham get thee out of thy country you pride yourself too much you pride yourself have you not seen people today I'm an American and so what the soul of an American and the soul of a Congolese is the same in the eyes of God If Abraham didn't have encounters, he would have been fighting for birthright with his brothers and say, I must inherit what Tara have. It's not about the possession of Tara. There is something beyond the stars. And so when Elohim descended from heaven and spoke to him, he discovered that earth is not an advantage. I must pursue that being that called me. And because I've encountered him, even if he tells me to leave everything, it will no longer be a sacrifice. Because I know I'm heading towards something that cannot be wailed by values among men. If you don't have encounters, you may kill yourself with zeal, you'll still be wrong. That's why accuracy is a product of encounters. Did you not read about Moses? He wanted to kill Egyptians. How many Egyptians will you kill? And even if you succeed in killing the Egyptians, where God wants to walk with Israel is not in Egypt. There are many people that enter ministry with zeal. Zeal is not correct. And there are many people who are afraid. When God sets them, they refuse to go. Both of them are not correct. It will take only an encounter for you to be able to step into ministry and to be accurate. And so Moses, when he ran to the backside of the desert, the Bible said in Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, that he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he saw a bush burning that was not consumed. And he, and he said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. And God spoke. He said, take off thy sandals. Where you are standing is holy ground. You have done business with Pharaoh. You have walked in the palace. But you have come among beings that you are not even qualified to walk with sandals. Take off your sandals. You are coming among beings of holiness. You are coming to places where the stature of a man is not what he has. It's who he is. In this realm, holiness is what defines our value. Take off your sandal. And Moses, before he came, he was stripped. And when he showed up, the immortal began to talk to him. If you don't have encounters, you'll be wrong. Paul the apostle was so zealous. In his zeal, he wanted to kill everybody that called on the name of Jesus. He was wrong until he had an encounter. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest believers and to put them in prison. You see how zeal can kill. A man is doing everything, but he's wrong because he has not seen beyond the stars. He has not looked into the crystals of God to find out the bearing of the Father. And then he's running with zeal. That you are doing it and you are feeling emotional and sweating does not mean you are right. I did a teaching recently on prayer. Our, in our generation now, if you are praying and you are not doing like this, oh, 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 oh you are not started praying. And I said, the, the goal of Zion is not Rave. The goal of Zion is bet. So if you do like this and you have not betted, you have not prayed, you have just been youthful. Because youth like that, when you are 70 years old, you won't do like this. But you will know that prayer is about betting, not about... And so Paul carried so much zeal until God appeared to him. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Can you imagine the man who was so zealous, arresting men and putting in prison? He doesn't even know the God he thinks he's having. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. He said, It is hard to kick against the bricks. That means everything Paul was doing in his life was against God. He took an encounter for his paradigm to be redefined. Without encounters, you can't fulfill ministry. This is why we labor in prayer. We labor in intimacy. That by all means, we will see what God is saying about us. I know it's good to preach. I know it's good to prophesy. I know it's good to pray for the sick. I know it's good to travel around the world and preach the gospel. But Father, which one have you allocated to me? Because there are many things to do. And if care is not taken, I will begin to do things 
that you did not allocate to me. So in order to be accurate, the reference point of ministry is encounter. This is why when men don't have encounter, many times, you find too many contradictions. Because the spirit, they try to, to, to boldly and totally represent. They don't even know him. Even Jesus, in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, he was a carpenter until the day of encounter. He said as he was baptized, when they were bringing him out of the water, he said the heavens opened. And the Holy Ghost said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That was the day ministry began. He didn't do ministry because he is God. You know the way the Bible introduced him? He said that in John chapter 1 verse 1. He introduced him with four credentials. He called him God. He called him creator. He called him life. And he called him light. But he could not manifest any of them. He said in the beginning was the world. The world was with God. And the world was God. So he was called God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Creator. In him was life. Life. And the life was the light of men. So the, the, the being that was called God, the being that was called creator, the being that was called life and light could not carry out ministry until an encounter came. For 30 years, he waited for that encounter. Many people jump out with zeal that you are an orator. does not mean you are a preacher. Because you are not going to speak English. You are going to speak spirit and life. And until you have an encounter, life cannot be injected. Why is this so important to have an encounter? Number one, purpose and calling is only revealed on the corridor of encounters. Jeremiah was a son of a priest. He would have ended up being a priest because being a priest is a good thing. But that is a good thing does not mean that is what God called you to do. And he said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet. Meanwhile, in those days, it is priests that are important. But you see, I didn't call you to be a priest. Because the job I want you to do is not the job of standing in the gap. It's a job of uprooting nations and planting new nations. You will need the mantle of a prophet to do that. So even though priesthood is good, your own calling is to be a prophet. So it will take an encounter amongst the plethora of good things to find out the one that God created you to carry out. If not, you will walk through your lifetime doing good things, but not doing what God called you to do. This is why ministry does not begin until you have an encounter. The second thing encounters do. Meanwhile, it's important for me to tell you the difference between a purpose and a calling. A purpose is what you were born to do. A calling is how you should do that which you were born to do. What you were born to do and how you should do what you do are different things. You can be born to deal with sicknesses and diseases. But you may need to do it by an anointing. And you may need to do it by the wisdom of medical science. So purpose is what you are born to do. Calling is how you should do it. Only encounter can reveal both to you. Number two. Why you need an encounter. Is because on the strength of discovery of purpose and calling. Then your work can attract reward. Because God will not reward you for what he didn't send you to do. That's why you have not started ministry until you have had an encounter. Because you can labor for God on earth, but there's no reward. Imagine if you are employed to a company. And then you just showed up in the morning. And you say, kai, kai, kai. The hold up in the gate is too much. And you spend your whole month at the gate. Meanwhile, they called you to be the accountant of the company. But for the whole month you were at the gate doing traffic control if the security man sees that you are good he will rest because he is tired so, so most of the things we are doing now some people now will see that okay since God has sent somebody they are now resting but they won't pay you salary for working at the gate they called you to be an accountant because while you are at the gate something else is suffering and God will pay you for what he has called you to do and if you don't have an encounter you won't know what God called you to do and they say today we are praying for widows for one year you are praying for widows you are praying is it good to pray for widows yes but that one year you are praying for widows is the one year that god says you go to the orphanage in congo 
The reward is allocated to the work you should do at the, at the orphanage in Congo. Because that praying for widows you are doing, God has raised somebody else to do it. Without encounters, there will be no reward. Because you will do what you were not sent to do. Number four, number three. Why encounters are important? They give you specific direction. That's why I say, get thee out. That's why I say, go back to Egypt. When people struggle with direction, it's because they've not had encounters. And so ministry begins when a man encounters the God that bets his ordination. And when he has those encounters, those encounters will furnish purpose and calling. Those encounters will furnish direction. And those encounters will provoke a basis for reward. So, the first protocol for ministry is encounters. Number two, the second protocol for ministry or for the core is the mandate. You are not in ministry until your mandate has been well defined. These things I'm sharing with you the lack of it is the reason for the charade we see in the body of Christ today. People don't know their mandates. So they are jealous of other people. If your mandate is to be an intercessor, why are you troubled about the person traveling from nation to nation? It will not even get your attention because it's not part of your script. The reason you can be jealous about what somebody else is doing is because you don't know the one you are called to do. If God calls me to sleep, why will I be bothered about the person dancing? If God calls me to intercede, why will I be bothered about the person who is on every flyer? The reason you find jealousy, backbiting, evil in church is because mandates are not known. So people want to do everything. If God tells you your place is at the back, naturally the desire to stay at, at the front will die. Because you know that's not where you were sent to. But when people don't know their mandate, then there will be a problem. Remember, we are using Abraham, Moses, Paul, and Jesus as case studies. You have seen that all of them had encounters before they started. You would also see that every one of them had definite mandates from God. For Abraham, the Bible said to him in Genesis 12, I've already quoted it, but I want to show you something there again. Because after God told him to get out of his country, get out of his kindred, get out of his father's house, God now showed him the mandate. He said, I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thee great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So Abraham knows that his mandate is to become a nation. It's on the strength of that understanding that made Abraham live the kind of life he lived. When Abraham wanted to bury his wife, they offered to give him a burial ground for free. He refused. Because he's building a nation. He doesn't want the people to come tomorrow and begin to fight assets with his children. He knew his mandate. When Abraham wanted his son to get married, he told Eliezer, to ensure that they don't get a wife from him among these people. He said to send him back to his father's land and get a wife from among his people because he didn't want corruption. He didn't want mixture. He knew God was doing something and he will need a pure breed to sustain it. So the marriages of Abraham and his children was informed based on the mandate. Why? I will make of thee a great nation. If he marries from the nation around, or if his sons marry from the nation around, they will make those hidden nations too great. So the mandate informed their marriages, the mandate informed their lifestyle and the way they did business. Don't dash me your land. No, I will pay for it. What is the what? He measured it and paid. When Abraham went to the battle of the kings in Genesis 14 and destroyed four kings, the king of Sodom came to give him the spoils. He said, I will not take 
even a latchet from you lest you say you made Abraham rich the man knew that God brought him to make a nation that mandate informed everything Abraham did you can afford to go and watch Chelsea because your mandate have not been defined you think you are a preacher if you know you are a witness before you preach one message you will sit down until God talks to you because you know for you it's not Bible study when you talk you are moving a generation to another dispensation you have not known your mandate that's why you can do what every other person is doing when the new hairstyle come out you are the first to model it when they, they bring new fashion they are tearing their jeans when they see you on Monday you are, your jean is torn with a very big canvas and then you are walking like this why? because when you come you can read the Bible if you know your mandate you will know it's not about reading the Bible you will know you are an oracle you bring the oracles of God to a generation and people who are able to carry the oracles of God they hide in the secret place until the shadow of the almighty comes upon them and sometimes for you to be able to touch that shadow it will take one week so you may you may stay indoors for five days to preach one message because you are not a bible teacher you are not a theologian you are a witness to a generation only your mandate can confer such bodies on your heart you find people loafing around and calling themselves ministers is because they don't know their mandate a man like abraham cannot afford to be careless around family because he knows that god have raised him to what become a great nation and he knows the tributary through which that nation can be formed will be through family what was the mandate of moses get down to egypt tell pharaoh let my people go that they may worship me exodus 5 verse 1 exodus 7 verse 16 exodus 8 verse 1 exodus 9 verse 1 is it that most
you are a teacher sir somebody can raise the dead celebrate god when you finish sit down carry your tools and begin to open the bible when you are done teaching go home because your report card is not with the congregation your report card is in heaven no man can mark it and men can clap you out of destiny and men can choose not to clap but because of your mandate even though men despise you you will walk into glory and the angels will rise up to celebrate your arrival the name of the lord is reproached and ministry have been bastardized because people who have not satisfied the requirement of the call have appeared on the scene when god has not sent them Hallelujah. 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 No, 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 don't bother yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm trying to look for oil. There's something. My tongue. I, I want to lubricate my tongue a bit. You know, I'm trying to, I'm balancing it between, I'm, I'm saving my energy for evening, but I'm, I'm sensing that something will need to break here. Because somebody who came here, we live here. You know, when, when, when Saul met Samuel, he said, as you depart from me, he said, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be changed into another man. Somebody who is hearing this, you are not hearing something is happening to your molecular structure because the god of heaven is beginning to re-engineer your system the areas of deficiency is working on you to shape you so that you become that perfect minister that can bring his government to a generation hallelujah 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. is God's battle axe. There's something happening to this person. And I'm seeing the figure of a woman. This is a weapon in the hand of God. As, as, as you are hearing me now, God is changing you to a weapon. A battle axe. And you will leave this place and suddenly, even your wars will become weapons of war. Hallelujah. name of Jesus in the name of Jesus just stay calm so we don't get emotion I'm seeing somebody a, a coal of fire is, is is coming on your tongue just stay calm so it's not emotional there is a baptism an impartation of fire it's like the betting of a revivalist something is about to hit you it will it will change this person father whoever that one is that you are bringing an ordination of a revivalist by the spirit of fire i release that impartation now take that grace in the 
the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Please sit down for a moment. I don't want to digress from this message. A minister's conference, so let's teach. So the, the mandate of Abraham was to raise a nation. The mandate of Moses was to deliver Israel from captivity. Moses preached that message again and again and again and again and again because it was a body. Go, tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may worship me. Go, tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may worship me. Go, tell Pharaoh. If you like, preach heaven and earth. Moses has a mandate. The gimmicks, the backbiting, the somersault on the platform to create impression and failing to make impact is because there's a lack of mandate. They've not waited on God to receive a mandate. They jump out and pressure. Society, circumstances put pressure on them and they want to do all kinds of things. Paul In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 Reveal this mandate to us He said unto me Who oh, am less Than the least of all the saints Is this grace given That I shall preach among the Gentiles The unsearchable riches of Christ There is nothing you will make Do to Paul That will stop him from unveiling the depths of Christ the depths he knew his mandate and that's why in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 he said oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you before whom Christ was evidently made manifest crucified amongst you so the teachings of Paul is like an artwork painting Jesus on the cross for your sin when Paul preaches you can literally see Jesus hanging on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, they say, we preach Christ and him crucified. The Jews seek a sign. He said, the Greeks seek wisdom. Even though Paul was a lawyer, an orator by excellence, he had studied under the best, but when he shows up, his goal is not wisdom. His goal is to unveil Christ because there's a mandate. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1, he said, when I came unto you, I did not come with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the counsel of God. I choose to know nothing among you, save Christ and him crucified. That was, my, that was his mandate. And it was enough. You see preachers today, 2010, they look like one preacher. 2013, they look like another preacher. 2017, the way they are changing, that's how their title are changing. They were pastors until the rise of the prophetic. They now become pastor prophet. After a while, pastor will vanish, prophet. Then the apostolic age, then prophet apostle. After a while, prophet vanish, apostle. A day come, they are now everything. It's a moiba. It's the, um, it, they are shapeless in the spirit. Because there's no mandate. When you don't have a mandate, you'll be a victim of pressure. And if pressure arrests your soul, you'll be wrong in ministry. Because your brother started with a 10,000 seat auditorium. The little money God gave you to guide you for one year, you use it to pay for one month rent. And when they ask you, you say, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
after 30 days we will see the weight of that faith and then you see them running into debt if they call you any day any time they need money why the brother came into the city he started with early screen and a 10,000 seat auditorium meanwhile God sent that man with different tools to address different people God sent you with different tools to address different people probably what God wants you to do is to sit on few people and make them giants the other person God sent people to him to address their needs part time so whether he likes it or not there will be cloud and you whatever you do if you like stay on all television stay on all media channels nobody will come because the tools God gave you is not for crowd and even if the crowd come they will go back because what God taught you is not for many it's for few because God wants you to raise warriors and then the point come you despise what God has given to you they come to church instead of thanking God for the 20 people that are growing rapidly they are so offended and they even begin to despise those people and they use their hands to destroy what God has given to them if you are a student of the move of God you'll discover the 70s to the 80s you had the likes there were three major people that made so much impact in the US Kenneth E. Hagin Ora Roberts and T.L. Osborne or a robots will travel and pack out hundreds of thousands of people in different stadia. Can the Hagin will sit in a small tent teaching people Bible? He didn't travel to up to three nations. He sat down and was writing books. T.L. Osborne had a big or a robot has a big tent where he works miracles. It was just miracles. So one was writing books, one was working miracles, and one was traveling from nation to nation. One day, three of them stood on the stage, and the lost one looked at them, because they were like brothers. He said, see how God has used us to shape the world. If you don't know what God has told you, you will ask yourself, are we the one shaking the world, or you are the one shaking the world? Because at that present time, he was the one traveling around. Few years later, there's no pastor in the world today who have not read the book by Kenneth Hagin. He didn't need to travel anywhere, but his books traveled around the world. Imagine if Kenneth Hagin put himself under pressure that he too wants to organize crusade in stadiums. He would have spent all his money and no stadium would have been full because God didn't send him to stadiums. Too much gimmicks because we don't have mandates. When you know your mandate, you will settle there. The first thing it will do is that it will cure you of pressure. The second thing it will do is that it will bring you rest. Rest. You will stop looking around. Thank God for what Apostle A is doing. Thank God for what Apostle B is doing. We were called to complement each other, not to compete with one another. I will never try to do what Apostle A is doing or what Apostle B is doing or what Apostle C is doing. I saw what was written concerning me and it's enough. Because I'll be rewarded based on what God wrote about me. If you know the level of witchcraft in ministry today, witchcraft and witch hunting, somebody will talk to you about a pastor he will, what he will say will be worse than a sinner. And then when you say, what did he do? He won't say anything. They said, they said, they said. Because there is bitterness in their heart towards that person. They become evangelists of doom. They've not preached about Jesus to 10 people. But they preached about somebody else to a thousand people in the negative light. Because of the gall of wickedness. You see pastors dying of blood pressure, high blood pressure. Why? This man organized meeting the last time, they had seven overflows. 
And so this time around, they will use the whole ministry funds to put on put B board everywhere. When he wastes ministry money in putting on the B boards, he now comes for the meeting and the hall is half filled. So when he goes home, there will be a hole. A hole will just appear in his heart. A hole will appear there. And then he will sleep and die. <laughs> I'm not talking. See, there's a place for inspiration. There's a place for motivation. There's a place for encouragement. But if, they, if there is a pressure, a competitive pressure, then it's no longer inspiration. And that can only happen if you don't know your mandate. The third thing mandates will do for you is that it will fortify your direction. To cure your pressure, bring you into rest, and fortify direction for you. That's why before God sends any man into ministry, he must insist that that man finds his mandate. Even Jesus had a mandate. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, it says, And she shall be with child. He shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's why other people do ministry and end up in a stadium. Jesus did ministry and ended up on the cross. With everybody shouting, crucify him, crucify him. But even in the midst of that, there was peace. Because he knows that except the son be lifted up, he can't draw all men to himself. So, even though the cross is not what you would desire for your friend, his mandate insists that only by the cross can that be achieved. Refuse pressure. Stay with God until he gives you a clear-cut mandate. Then you are ready for ministry. Number three, divine empowerment. We are not orators. We are not lecturers. We are sent with divine ability to change the stories of men and to cause them to align with what God says about them. That's why I told you ministry is about betting kingdom. And I told you kingdom is a testimony of the will of the Father, the life of the Son, and the glory of the Holy Ghost. So when we show up, we may be talking, but we are enforcing the will of God over you. You may be listening and you were designed to live here and run into an accident. But somewhere, somehow, because you came under the radar, your steps will be manipulated. You may not even know what God has done. You may come under atmospheres like this, an arrow has been shot for you, but when you go out, the glory on your life has increased. And that arrow will go back. It can't pinch on you. The will of God is forced because you opened your heart. You come to a place like this, you are struggling with an addiction. You can't tell anybody. But suddenly, while you are yet hearing, the volume of the life of God in you increases. And that life chokes that addiction. You may come, you struggle with praying. But when you come, life grows in you. And you go back. Even while you are yet going home, pataka, patoka, tataka. you don't know what's happening. Something has changed. We came to bring life. And the glory of God on your life begins to increase. And you go somewhere, suddenly they pick you out and favor you. You are wondering, what did I do? It's glory that have increased. Glory has increased. Places where you would have been naturally rejected from, you come and they respond to you. What has happened? Glory has increased. So we are not orators. We are empowered vessels to bring kingdom and government to people. And so you cannot set out a ministry until you are empowered. Refuse to jump out and find yourself on the stage and begging God, begging God, Lord, please do something. Lord, please do something. It's not a place you want to be. We don't go to minister. And then it's when we show up, we are now begging God to please help us, help us. I've done that many times. Because I didn't wait for empowerment. I will come to the altar. I check, check. Nothing is happening in my spirit. And I now start worshipping. When I'm worshipping, I'm, I, 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 even if it's, 
Even if it's just this night, only this night. If you deliver me this night, every instruction you give me, I will obey. If you say I should fast for one year, I will fast. And God will deliver me that night and I will still not do it. And then the next time I will discover myself on the stage again. And the person who invited me will say it's miracle service. And when I turn around, I will now see somebody with crutches. Before, before we start preaching in such situation, where we face this side, and I'm speaking tongues, I'm speaking. Because if you look there, your faith will die. When we're speaking tongues, speaking tongues, and sing, and sing. God told me, deliver yourself from that pressure. Your platform is not where you are preaching from. Your platform are the circumstances of life. That's why I empower you. When the blind come, that's when you prove the seed of your apostleship. So it's not the time for you to start begging me. No. I now realize you've got to be empowered because the princes will come to check you. They will come to prove what you claim to be and what you stand for. And when you meet spirits, you don't speak language. It's a game of power. It's a game of power. The God of the Hebrew have sent me. Let my people go. Who is your God? And why should I obey him? Moses knew what he meant. It's not nomenclature. If you like, call a thousand names. Pharaoh is not interested in names. Try to define him. Pharaoh is not interested in divination. And that's why God knows. And before he sent Moses, he had to give him powers. Because if there is no power, when you go to the world and they place a demand on that call, you will bring reproach to the name of God. Because when you meet Pharaoh, Pharaoh is not interested in your definition. You can define God to Israel and tell them the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of... Pharaoh doesn't know Abraham. What Pharaoh is interested in is power. And so when Moses speaks and Pharaoh doesn't respond, he will stretch his rod on the Nile and the Nile will turn to blood. The next day, Pharaoh will come and say, please, please, I repent, I repent. It's power, they understand. Did you not read in Exodus? When Israel was about to leave Egypt, Pharaoh said, pray for me. That's the king of the hidden. Pray for me. After your firstborn died, I shall pray for you. See, everybody submits to power. He said, through the greatness of thy power, shall thy enemies submit themselves to thee. You jump out with a suit. Who told you suit is credential? The suit I'm wearing is the native dress of the Englishman. This is not, it has nothing to do with ministry. I'm just looking like an Englishman. In fact, that's why I'm speaking English. If you carry this one to ministry, you will die. Tell your neighbor, suit doesn't make ministry. You will die. You need to be clothed with power. Did you read about Abraham? Genesis 14 verse 14. The kings have seized thy brother Lot and have taken him. He said Abraham took 318 trained servants. Trained. There's a technology of empowerment. And he said Abraham divided himself into them. Uh, if I talk about that thing, you will not understand it. Abraham divided himself and a man defeated four nations. It takes power to be in ministry. Did you not read about Moses? Ten times he brought plague on Egypt and one man with a staff shut down the civilization. How did it happen? Power, empowerment. If you don't have empowerment, you have no calling. The ministry is not English. A calling is synonymous to empowerment. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 20, the Bible said Moses took his wife and his son and Moses took the rod of God. So when Moses was going to Egypt, he knew the same Egypt he ran from is where he was coming back. But this time, he was coming with the rod of God. When you stay with this God, a point will come. A surgery will happen to you. 
He said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the law. And suddenly, the talker truly for the first time became a prophet. He said one of the seraphims took the coals of fire and he touched it on my tongue. When he came back, he didn't just talk about battles anymore. He said unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government of this world shall be. He began to prophesy the messianic prophets, prophecies, because power had come. There is something about your eye. It's not for beauty, for eyelashes. When power comes, you can look at a man and a demon will check out. Who told you your hand is for eating food alone? He said they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Your hand is a channel of power. When you are so empowered, a point comes. Anything that touches you carries God. Paul had the dimension. He said, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Saul. Acts 19, verse 11 and 12. Handkerchiefs and apron. That means when I go home and take off this suit, what is on this suit is not sweat. It's not sweat. When you are empowered, you don't sweat on your clothes. You deposit God on your clothes. And somebody can take your shirt and your shirt will do more than enough. I heard the story of E.A. Adeboe. He went to London and he ate and remained. And a woman who was barren for 12 years came and ate it. And the woman took in in two weeks. That's why he can afford to speak slowly. Because if he say, God bless you, that God bless you can affect 10 million people. It's power. Some people think ministries is charisma. So when they are talking, they are doing like this. If there is no power, that thing is, is just cool. It's, it's just, you are dancing. But when there is power, if you roar, you are uprooting nations. Everything you do is a dimension of power. Did you, don't you read about God? When God laughs, he says he puts his enemy in derision. So the laughter of God is a confusion to the camp of the enemy. Because when a man is empowered, everything about him is a weapon. And everything he does is a strategy of war. That's what ministry is about. We have been deceived. We show up, we speak in a certain way, dress in a certain way, and we think that's all there is. You are called, you must get power. Abraham had power. Moses had power. Paul had power. And when it came to Jesus, Ella, it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. Jesus was, see, Jesus was allergic to oppression. So when Jesus walks by, oppressions go down. Many times he came into the temple and demons began to scream, away from us, why have you come before your time? Hope you know that this Jesus was in the same kingdom for 30 years empowerment had not come but in matthew 4 15 he said he returned in the power of the spirit when power comes ministry begins the one you are doing before that time is lecture luke 4 14 he returned in the power of the of the spirit that's why he waited in fasting for 40 days and 40 nights because he knows aramaic cannot cast out demons hebrew cannot cast out demons you can carry your bible and quote greek hebrew and aramaic and mingle it the demon will sit there until you speak power you can't touch his realm when power came they said to him and said lazarus thy friend is sick he relaxed it doesn't matter whether he's sick or dead when i go anything happening will end and to make things worse when he died he said lazarus is asleep thomas said, if lazarus is asleep he will wake up now in the realm of power, anything you call it, that's what it is. So you can call death sleep. Death is sleep. And when he showed up, they had put him in the tomb. He said, roll away the stone. And when he looked up, he said, I thank you, Father. Because you always hear me. Lazarus, come forth. They wrapped the man. The power did not only raise him from the dead. The volume was so much that the power carried him to the door. And he said, lose him, let him go. So he walking from the dead, he
jacked him from where he was and pulled him to the door power that's what defines ministry possible by talking there's a power that backs my ordination I don't talk I showcase God and one of the ways to do it is by power in John 21 25 I saw the most mind-blowing scripture of my life it said many things did Jesus that were not recorded for if they were recorded there's no volume John 21 25 there's no volume of books in the world that can contain it. Meanwhile, in John 14, 12, Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. Ah. If Jesus greets you, there's a supernatural element in it. If Jesus shakes you, something happened to you. And I told myself, the things Jaco did, he was playing. Do you know who Jaco is? Somebody has cancer. Jaco will hold it like this and pull it out. When you see that, if they say, do you want to receive Jesus? If you have received it before, you will come back. You know the one you receive is Christ's play. tell you things like this ground is hard hard to what when power comes power lost hard ground is this soft ground we are looking for before then what is the ministry it said the light shines in the darkness light does not shine in light the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not if there are no challenges what then are the testimonies testimonies are a proof that impossibility was made possible so when you find the hard ground get power from the spirit that's why god sent you there today you see people doing politics to be posted to good places because there's no power if you have power if they send you to a village you say thank god at least here every service a cripple will come here every service the blind will come and that village will become a, an embassy an embassy because of the terrible things that God will do in righteousness. We don't have we don't have ministers. We have drama kings. When we come for a meeting and we look around and there's nobody looks sick, we we'll now say today, whatever your sickness is, 
when you show up and they put four people on which year you will now hear the same minister saying we we can't heal the sick it's only jesus that heals the sick but a generation will become angry and say i will not do it the usual way i will go the supernatural route paul knew this and in second corinthians 5 2 he said we groan we groan earnestly that we may be clothed you will leave this conference and tell yourself i will not be a talker i will groan until that power comes upon me who told you they can despise you they can only despise you when power is not there when there's no power they can say you are young come with power and then you will discover that age is not a factor when you don't have power they can say you are a woman come with power let's see who we remember gender Ami Semper McFassin in 1985 was sitting 35,000 people who told you gender is a factor Maria Woodward Etta was a mother in Israel because of power you can't despise them the reason they despise your call is because there's no power the reason demons play around you is because there's no power because power is not just to heal the sick the capacity to walk in holiness is power everybody can fornicate i have the power to stand he said this commandment have i received of my father i have the power to lay down my life and to take it up this man ruled their body paul said in first corinthians 9 27 i beat my body and bring it under subjection it's both intrinsic and extrinsic we are a generation without power a man of god goes somewhere and he comes back the next tale you hear is that he is left with somebody meanwhile a doctor who is a gynecologist is seeing naked women every day and there are some of them who are still upright weakness everywhere because there's no empowerment you are not a minister until you are truly empowered abraham was empowered moses was empowered paul was empowered jesus was power please sit down i have two more we are rounding up the fourth protocol of the call is divine strategy divine strategy divine strategy is a product of inspiration today ministers hire people to come and think so that they will use the best idea you are representing a spirit and a professional will come and think for you that's why i told you growth is not horizontal it's vertical you are so plugged into god that every breaking news will catch it that's how the elders worked I read for you already the strategy he gave him was to come out of his father's house i will show you a land so when it came out it didn't make sense but that's called divine strategy how can you leave your father's land when god begins to lead you it may not make sense but the result will prove that you are wiser than men moses he gave him a strategy he sent him to Pharaoh and he told him to demonstrate power and when they were coming to the promised land he gave him a strategy everybody should be circumcised before they enter these guys knew what they should do by the spirit that's why they succeeded Paul had a strategy Paul's strategy is church planting and itinerant missions so Paul will move to this city, plant a church, sit over them for two years, leave them, and move to another city, and he will leave somebody there. He left Timothy in Ephesus. He left Titus in Crete. And as he kept doing it, he was planting the, the torch everywhere. The people before him sat in Jerusalem. The first disciples sat in Jerusalem. He didn't come and copy and paste and say, okay, me too, I'll go and create my own headquarters. No. 
In Acts 13 from verse 1, he said, As they ministered to the law, the law said, Separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas. Inspiration came. And so they began to move from city to city. And they were planting churches, planting churches, planting churches. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul called himself a wise master builder. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he said, Paul planted Apollos water. So he was planting and discipling people. And when he's done, he moves to another city. There may be somebody else God sends. He sits in one place, he raises men, and he shoots them like arrows. Another person, God will send him. He will plant, he will move, plant, move, plant. If you take the strategy of the other man, it will not work for you. He said, Issachar will prosper in his travels. Zebulun will prosper in the tent. Everybody has a strategy. If you have not pressed into God enough to catch a strategy in the spirit, you are not a ministry. Not long enough, it will show. Jesus also had his own strategy. Jesus replicated himself. And he did it so well. In Luke 22, 48, when they wanted to betray him, they couldn't identify which is Jesus. Judas had to kiss him. Because if you come, you can carry Peter. The replication was so perfect. That everyone became like Jesus. In Acts 4.13, they say when they saw the boldness of Peter, they took note that this man had been with Christ. So Jesus' strategy was first of all, replication. You come to him, he make you like himself. The second strategy of Jesus was to travel to every city and every village. In Matthew 9.35, he said he went into all their towns and all their villages he didn't sit in one place he was itinerant in nature and the third strategy of jesus was to be lifted on the cross so first replication through deep association and intimacy second traveling from city to city to affect everywhere and third to go to the cross so that the places he could not go to the men by the spirit to be drawn to him there must be strategy strategy is not a function of human intelligence it's a product of inspiration from the holy spirit what are the advantages of strategies number one they will make you invincible in ministry when men think they've seen all of you then god brings another inspiration and they will see something entirely different a complete shift in paradigm and they will wonder what manner of man is this the fifth requirement for ministry in the protocol of the core is divine allocation we are not all sent to the same place don't come to lagos because somebody is succeeding in lagos if you come to lagos your ministry may end in hold up you watch on television they say all the mega churches are in lagos don't make the mistake if god has not sent you you know Sometimes I come to Lagos, I see a church, 6,000, 10,000, 30,000. And then it took an average of two hours to come. And I say, how do these people come here? And then they closed from church. The first time I came for a conference in Lagos, we closed around 8. I got home by 12 midnight. And the next morning we came, the place was packed. I said, what is happening here? They are sent. If God doesn't send you and you come, you will end in a batter. And your evangelism campaign will end the hold up. You will run out of the place. Everybody successful in ministry goes to the places where they are sent. I wanted to go to the north. I love to see people burning with fire. And I knew that kind of Christianity would be in the north. When God told me to go to Abuja, I started imagining, how will I do evangelism in Abuja? Everybody, people don't even move around. They, they cab. If, if people are trekking like where I knew in Makodi, I would have said, okay, I'll meet one or two. How, is it that I'll be entering cabs to do evangelism? People live in estates, you enter, everybody's indoor. How, how do you penetrate this kind of city? I was so pained. And all my life, I've done ministry in the north and in the east. If I come to the north, I will be a king. He sent me to Abuja. I said, well, how do I survive? But when he sends you to a place, everything you need will meet you there. 
Some people stand up, they, 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 they have visa. They now say, the next headquarter is Canada. When you go to Canada, the region you will have accommodation, the temperature will be minus 25 degrees. Every morning, the, the whole place will be full of snow. Your church will be on ice block. And because, because you came from Africa, you won't survive. Don't be creative. This is a business of spirits. And that's why I told you the weight of ministry is intimacy. I can come here and teach you a thousand and one principles. But those same principles they can teach you in Harvard Business School. You don't know. Those of you who have done managerial courses in business school, you know now. Most of the things we teach are, they are principles of business school. Principle of association. Principle of management. You don't need the Holy Ghost to know it. I'm telling you divine secrets that only through intimacy will you discover. Another man can't even tell you. Everything I'm showing you here, only God can tell you. No man can tell you your mandate. No man can tell you your location. No man can empower you. So it is in intimacy that you bet these things by intercourse. That's what makes a true minister. Abraham in Genesis 12 2, we saw that God said, go to the land that I will show you. Moses in Exodus 3 verse 9 and 10, we saw that God said, go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. In Acts 22, 21, Paul said, God sent me to the Gentiles. Everybody has a location where he sent to. Galatians 2, 9, God sent me to the Gentiles. The apostles perceived that grace. Jesus himself, Matthew 15, 23, I have come to save the lost of the household of Israel. So in the days of Jesus in the flesh, he only ministered to those in Israel. When he was resurrected, the description changed. He was sent to all the world. All that is lost. He said, go into all the world. See, these things are specific. Don't just wake up and say, things are working in Abuja. Things are working in Lagos. It's where things work that people drown the most. Do you know the level of connection required to survive in Lagos? Only to come out of the airport is a body. If you don't know how to, to run things, your minister will, will be held up in hold up. Conference will finish. It will happen three times. They will call you a liar. And ministry will pack up. You've got to be sent to a place. Why is that important? Your allocation is in the location where God sent you. Bow your heads and pray. Tell the Lord, the prayer point is single. Father, give me the body for intimacy. I want to know you. I know you've known men of God. You've known many principles. But now you want to do ministry and you want to do it with impact. Ask God for body for intimacy. People say they are preachers. The hardest thing for them to do is prayer. Well, even when you call for group prayer, a man of God, he will go out and come back, he will check the car, he's looking for what we while away time. Because prayer is a, is a hard thing for him. He can sit down and argue or watch the news or watch football. But the moment he carries the Bible, he's dozing off. Because there is no hunger. Ask God for intimacy, the grace to tarry. Hunger for the presence. Bodies. For depth in the spirit. Ask him this morning. And if you can encounter God. See how your life changes overnight. It's important for me to say. That encountering God does not mean you must see fire or light. That's not what I'm saying. You can encounter him in his word. He said God revealed himself again to Samuel in Shiloh. By the word of the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 21. So I'm not saying you should go and say a light. Somebody called me and said, what do you do for angels to appear to you? You are not sent to look for angels. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying supernaturally, God will bring his realm to you. It can be through, a, through his word. He can choose to come to you. He can choose to send a man. Whichever way, there's got to be an encounter. There's got to be a clear mandate. There's got to be an empowerment. There's got to be a, an allocation based on the location that you are sent. Tell God to allow you to walk through this protocol. 
Father, we thank you. On ground and on line, everyone following, I pray that you impregnate us with hunger. Give us the gift of hunger. Hunger, not depravity of you, but an insatiable passion for your presence and for your being. Bless us with those dimensions this morning, this afternoon. And let your name be glorified. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.